And I'll call the workshop meeting to order before you have a copy of the proposed agenda for tonight's meeting. Uh, yeah, also, uh, I would entertain a motion at this time to adopt the agenda. Who approve? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Also, you have minutes from a December 4th, 2018 regular meeting, and you also have these five uh, uh, consent items uh, to entertain a motion to uh, adopt. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, uh, we'll go down to the workshop topics, and the first one tonight will be the Hurricane Florence uh, Departmental Updates, continuation of that discussion, and I'll turn it over to you at this time, Dr. Woodward. Yes, sir. Well, yes, sir. <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much for joining us this evening to uh, give you a continued update. You know, in the past two workshops, we've had uh, comments regarding Hurricane Florence. Uh, just like the hurricane didn't move very quickly away from us, this report obviously has taken several meetings. What we'd like to do tonight, though, is finish the report by showing you the uh, challenges that transportation and other departments uh, face during the storm and also provide you with up-to-date financial uh, information. At the end of this, we will also give you recommendations from the manager's office relative to things that we believe that we need to be looking at between now and the next storm season. We're very fortunate also <laughs> this evening to have a gentleman who is the new representative liaison with the Small Business Administration, Pete Sinto, Pete, or better known as Pedro. Uh, he and I have had the opportunity to live in the same community in Florida. He comes from Naples, a wonderful gentleman with a great background of service. And he will also give you a greetings from the SBA after we have finished this. We'd like to start with Anthony talking about the impact that the storm had on transportation issues. Anthony. Thank you, Dr. Woodard. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, my voice is a little weak, and we've covered some of this territory before, so I'm going to try to keep this briefing pretty quick. But I did want to provide an update as to where we are with regard to recovery of the transportation, particularly the traffic signal system. <coughs> As you recall seeing some of these images, I believe it was in early October, there was a significant amount of damage. In fact, this is the most damage that we've had to the infrastructure since we took over maintenance and operational responsibility from DOT. In this particular case, we think that a tornado had touched down and basically destroyed the entire intersection. Some cases it looked as simple as just signal heads turned around, but if you look closer to that span wire going all the way across the intersection, you see all that slack that's kind of hanging down. Um, basically, that indicates that all of the cables that drive the individual signal heads have been cut and they were loose hanging down. One of the things that we learned during the storm, never really experienced this before, and we'll certainly take into consideration moving forward, it's the fact that while the overhead street name signs are excellent for navigation purposes, they also look nice, um, they cause a lot of damage in high winds. The reason is, is they act like a sail. And the cable that they hang on is the pivot point. So just think about during those heavy winds, that sign is flipping over and over and over and over. And then when it gets taut, it flips all the way back around. And then it does the same thing over and over again. That's probably what caused the majority of the damage out there. So next time uh, we run into a situation like a hurricane, heavy winds, we'll probably uh, go ahead and take those signs down. There's really no harm in doing that. They're relatively easy to take down and put back up. Uh, one thing that we have also learned is that um, whether it be snow and ice or whether it be a hurricane, as soon as the weather somewhat improves, People want to go out there and start looking around. So there is immediately traffic back on all of our major roadways. In this particular instance, there was only one traffic signal still functioning under its own power. Now that's out of a hundred of them that we currently maintain and operate. Ironically enough, it was the one in front of the police department. I still think the chief has it hooked up to the generator. <laughs> that is the only traffic signal that survived the storm. So as you can tell, we had a very long uh, journey ahead of us to not only fix the damage that had occurred, but also deal with the widespread power outages um, that we all experienced. 
we immediately deployed as, as soon as the winds were safe. You can see our crews are out there straightening heads, splicing wires where need be. We deployed generators, continually rotated those generators to, uh, to, to various intersections as power came back online. And um, I think the chief would agree that uh, the amount of time that was spent manually directing traffic after the event was relatively minimal. <clears throat> And that's because of the investment that we have made as a city and the infrastructure. We've got the generators, we've got the, the transfer switches, all of those things made a lot of difference. And being able to get the traffic system back up and running essentially on the first day after the storm. You'll also recall that when we gave you the briefing after Irene some eight years ago, one of the recommendations that we made at that time was that we would buy generators and that we would pre-wire the intersections. You authorized that and in your budgets over the last number of years, we have implemented that. And as Anthony said, that substantially reduced the impact on traffic control in the police department. So we followed through on your recommendation. That's exactly right. <coughs> Every single signal in the city limits has a transfer switch. So it's <coughs> main thing is is that it has that backup gener generator capability but it's also safe okay with the transfer switch you can easily just walk up plug it in and then it also isolates that traffic signal from the rest of the power grid so that as jones onslow or duke is out there working on it we're not back feeding the system again just lots of effort our guys did an amazing job 12 14 16 hours a day in the rain and the wind they just they really they really made us all proud that's for sure you don't realize how big those traffic are, right? signals are yeah. Yeah. Good point. See that's exactly next. right so next time you're at the traffic center go stand next to the one that we actually had there um, the four section head itself with the one that has the flashing yellow arrow is four feet tall uh, each one of those signal heads, uh, they have what we call a 12-inch LED in them. So the diameter of the, of the lens itself is 12 inches. Wow. Uh, an interesting thing here, you can see how long the visors are. So basically the hoods that go over the lights, those are 18-inch visors. Uh, we were able to put those up and take down some of the old louvers. You probably remember those at, at Cheney and Marine. There's old technology. This is the, the new new route. Keep moving here. So just again, some more signal work here. Um, we have rebuilt, I would say, seven or eight intersections. We've got a couple more left to go. And when I say rebuild, that means rewire every single foot. DOT, of course, is paying for all of that. They feel that all of it is reimbursable through FEMA. Good news about it is, is I briefed you before on how the ITS project was a great thing for our community, but it did fall a little bit short on some of the maintenance. So kind of the silver lining in this, in this event is the fact that traffic signal heads like the one you see there on the left, you don't see it that well when you're down on ground level, but you can see all the paint that's missing. The inside of those signal heads looks just as bad as the outside. So when we rebuild an intersection like this, we end up with all the equipment. Again, our guys did an amazing job. At this point, I would say that the system is probably at about 97%. We still have a few small things to fix, but yes, sir. I might have missed something here. Um, they're going to continue paying for these lights, right? The state yes. Yes. Oh, sir. Right. So this never going to be an expense pushed off on us? No, sir. No, sir. In fact, everything that we're doing here is fully reimbursable by FEMA. A majority of the reconstruction work, or I would say a fair share of the reconstruction work, is actually being done by one of DOT's contractors, but they pay them directly. But the gentleman there and, and, the, and, and the, on the screen, all the materials that we use are either reimbursed by DOT or provided by DOT up front. Yeah, the, the agreement we have with them has two sections. One has uh, amount of money that's reimbursed for maintenance tasks that are done on the signals. Another part pays for our traffic engineer. That's right. and that We do have two signals that the city owns. We do. So technically, <coughs> those are our responsibility. That's the one at uh, Harvard. Uh, Bayshore. 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 Oh, so down Bayshore here on New Bridge Street. Bridge Street. The, the two on New Bridge Street. 
And ironically enough, those were two that really didn't get impacted at all. You know, we just lost power for an extended period of time, but as soon as the power came back, they came back right off. Um, we did have some fiber damage as well. Uh, as you recall, fiber optic cable is the communication backbone of our entire system. Um, the downside with a lot of our fiber infrastructure is that it's right there next to the uh, power, the power lines. So power lines that were knocked down by trees or various things also caused, you know, the same thing happened to our fiber optic cable. Um, in many cases, it wasn't really what I would consider a crisis uh, type of situation. Um, something that we definitely were going to repair over time, but there was one instance out on Highway 258 where we had a real catastrophic failure of the, of the fiber optic cable there. It's the main trunk line that runs out 258, controls all of those signals, but at the same time, it also provides communication to the county government center. A tree fell on the line, knocked it into the road, the cable got ran over a bunch of times, okay? We knew that was something that we wanted to fix immediately, but we were preoccupied working on traffic signals, making sure that we were managing the traffic. So we called in the city of Wilson. We have a what would you call it, a mutual aid interlocal agreement, agreement, interlocal agreement with them. Called them in within 24 hours. That fiber optic cable was up and running. County was communicating. But at the same time, 258 became that major reentry route, the detour into Wilmington and Pender County and Brunswick County. We had communication. We were able to kind of maximize the traffic flow through there. Going back to generators, what we've learned over time is that while the one on the left is great for powering your home, it's a little bit overkill for what we need. Uh, the one on the right-hand side is, is definitely more suited for a traffic signal. Mm -hmm. so, thousand watts is, is plenty of power for a modern traffic signal with LEDs, low voltage computers, et cetera. And, and I do have to correct myself because last time we, we talked about generators, I mentioned that the one on the right was seven pounds. It's actually 20. So. Oh, where, where did you go to school? <laughs> okay. I went to school in the mountains. We'll just say that. <laughs> so, but the point is, you look at the space requirements of the generator on the left, the weight of the one on the left, the cost of the one on the left versus the one on the right. You man to, you <clears throat> man to move the one on the left, only one on the right. I mean, it just... The fuel consumption on and on and on and on. So um, during the storm, we basically broke 12 of them. By breaking them, I mean, we ran them until they died. Um, they just ran for weeks on end. We didn't really have any other choice. Of course, we were servicing them and everything. But so what we did is we replaced them with the suitcase generators on the right-hand side. We ordered 15 of those, and we just got those in stock. Cost comparison? Um, well, it really depends on which one. I would say the one on the left is probably, you know, $800, $900, something like that. The one on the right is probably, I think we got it for $599, something like that, a piece. So there is a cost, a small cost savings, but a cost savings nonetheless. Resiliency is a word that a lot of people have been using these days. And um, I think we understand what that means when we look at this picture. It's not a very resilient image, if you ask me. Um, the MPO and the, the Transportation Advisory Committee under the leadership of Mr. Warden and, of course, Mr. Thomas commissioned a, a subcommittee to look at network resiliency, figure out what that means and, of course, what we can do to make our transportation network more robust, not only for events like this, but also for other purposes. I think the primary end goal of that committee is to figure out how to maximize the investments that are already planned by the DOT. On the screen here, you see the red lines. Those are all funded TIP projects, funded roadway projects. The blue areas that are highlighted are where those TIP projects intersect with floodplains. So you can infer that those are areas in which inundation could occur. We've just started our effort on this. Our first meeting was in December. We just know that this is something that the MPO is, is wanting to address and wanting to address very soon. The 
This is also something that's being discussed at the DOT secretary level as well as the governor level. I fully expect to see either some sort of appropriation or design changes, or there might be a whole slew of things that change as a result of Florence, but our, our goal is to have a positive impact on trans mobility through these types of events. But as, a, as another silver lining, we mm -hmm. think we're getting state support now to get us an interstate designation in to help with their resiliency. You remember <coughs> I-40 got shut down for between, um, I don't know, Wallace and, and let's just say uh, Wilmington. Wilmington area. So <laughs> that's basically we're, we're now, they're now looking for us to, to help provide some resiliency to that state highway system. So for those folks, so that's exactly that, that right. is a blessing for us. There, there is a reason that the detour came through Jacksonville. The reason is, is because 24, as it sits today, is the most resilient route to Eastern North Carolina. If you look at I-40, let's just fast forward here. Can't see that very well. But uh, I-40 is kind of in the middle of the screen. It's the yellow road that's going, here we go. Glenn's gonna trace it for me. And then I-95 on the other side there, towards Fayetteville, those roadways have significant issues with flooding. My opinion, and I'm not an expert on either one of those roadways, even though I travel them often, is that elevating them to a level where inundation is not going to occur on a regular basis is cost prohibitive. Uh, it's also prohibitive from an environmental standpoint. There are a lot of issues with that damming of water and things of that nature. That being said, like Mr. Warden was saying, we're pursuing improvements to Highway 24. I didn't realize you were going. I, I was nice segue. No, that's well, perfect. Very excellent. Segment. It's a perfect segue. Uh, Mr. Alford, our new Board of Transportation, well, new prior Board of Transportation member, however you want to describe it, is fully on board with this, presented it to the Secretary, as well as the uh, Chief Operating Officer of DOT, which seems to, it seems to be grabbing a lot of traction for a variety of reasons. Now. It's not something that's gonna happen overnight. It's something that's gonna cost a good deal of money. But when you look at the cost comparison of making improvements to 40, making improvements to 95, and oh, by the way, making improvements to Highway 70, 70 is just as much of a mess. Um, actually, it's probably more of a mess if you flood on just a Tuesday, you know what I mean? But 24 is an excellent <laughs> option for this area as well as the state as a whole. Um, We've got a lot of partners on board, including the state port. I didn't realize this, but the entire time um, during the inundation of 70, 40, et cetera, all of the port traffic was coming down 24. There was a lot of, lot of tractor trailers. Mm -hmm. They didn't realize that a lot of that was poor. They didn't think about that. Mm -hmm. They were very happy with Highway 24. Yeah. They didn't find that out until after the fact, but there were a lot of very, um, there are a lot of rational reasons why this makes sense, not only from a resiliency standpoint, but from an economic development standpoint, from a military sustainability standpoint, et cetera. Uh, one of the things ultimately that we're trying to accomplish is that four lane divided connectivity between Jacksonville and Fayetteville. We know that that's a critical link as well. Because of these discussions, I believe Mr. Alford's been able to leverage some additional funding for projects that are shown towards the west of 40. You see those various colors. Like all but one of those was funded up until a couple of months ago, and I think he was able to leverage some funding for that last section, which is actually the red section there that says R2303F. Once that's completed, then there will be a four-lane divided highway all the way from, not, from uh, 40 to, uh, to Fayetteville, which if you've never made that trip, will make a huge difference. <laughs> Mayor and Council, that's all I have to add for tonight. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. As you can see, I think we're, there are a lot of very positive things happening right now. And these people really did an outstanding job of getting the intersections back up. I'm sure that when the Chief talks later that he will also agree that uh, what the, the traffic folks did was pretty amazing. 
What it also shows, though, is the investment that the mayor and council and the DOT have made over the last several years in the intelligent transportation system. Having that uh, control room there at the Center for Public Safety, having now our own staff that is responsible for repairing things, uh, it's made a major difference. And truly, uh, you, you don't realize how much better we handled the traffic issues after this storm than the faces or the issues we faced when Irene came through eight years ago. This storm was so much worse than Irene, but we handled the transportation system from our traffic management standpoint, picking any number, 500% better, 100 times better. I mean, any number you want, but you know, sometimes we forget the past because we're living in such an improved environment that we have today. But answering your people will be commended. Thank you. Thank you, so, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cost. <clears throat> Ms. Maids? It's a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we need. <laughs> uh, you're done. Long story <laughs> short. <laughs> Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. All right. Uh, just a few slides here to talk about some of the changes that have happened since the last time we had a storm, even since Matthew two years ago. Um, the cost recovery from Florence is not just a FEMA claim, but it's also we have to work with our insurance company and the adjuster there, which has proven to be um, a timely task because there are so many people in the eastern part of North Carolina who are have insurance claims and Actually, I'm sure some of you have experienced like, getting uh, an adjuster out to your house, or we've had the same, um, some of the same issues. Um, we have submitted the lift, list of the insurance claims to the league. Um, the adjuster did a site visit on October 15th. Um, he's waiting for some invoices and estimates for repairs from us. He has his pictures. He's made his assessment, and. Um, like I said, because of the major damage, it's just, it's going to be slow going. Um, I don't know. The last time we checked with him, he said, I don't know when I'll get to your paperwork. <laughs> so um, for FEMA reimbursement, just to remind you, the state of North Carolina picks up the 25% of the cost that um, the federal government does not refund us. They pay 75, the state pays 25. That's not the case in every state, but in North Carolina, that has historically been the case. Um, they have a new electronics grants portal. Um, we registered with the portal pre-storm. I think this is gonna be a big improvement. We had a lot of problem with lost paperwork in the past. With this, we upload it to a website, so hopefully there won't be resubmitting paperwork, and, and it's a whole new process we're having to learn, but I really think this is going to be a whole, whole lot better. Um, we can submit all of our documentation through the portal, um, and the communication with FEMA is handled through this, this grant portal. We've been assigned someone, and he's coming here like every Thursday afternoon and meeting with us to see what he can do to help with getting the, the paperwork submitted. And, um, Someone from where? From FEMA. From FEMA. Um, we attended the briefing on October 17th. We submitted our request, request for public assistance in the grants portal. We received our eligibility status on October 24th. Um, we now have, I said, been assigned the program delivery manager. Um, we had an exploratory call, then we had a recovery scoping meeting in December, um, and that was the first substantive meeting with FEMA. Um, it was an in-depth meeting regarding the disaster damages, and um, we talked about project formulation. Um, we have to upload the information, and the FEMA person says, these things go together, and we'll submit them as a what they call a project. You know, like if we have five roofs and they're individually don't meet a single project, he will submit them all together. So he's helping us with that. Um, that recovery scoping meeting also starts the clock running. We have 60 days from that December meeting to report the damage. We don't have to have it fixed. We don't have to have final estimates. We just have to have a list with some sort of estimate of what the damage is. And, 
And um, it also gives a chance to talk just a little bit to the FEMA people about some mitigation opportunities. Here's what everybody wants to know. Um, to date, we've spent $4.8 million on debris removal. The lion's share of that was the woody debris and disposal. That includes all of it, the monitor, the, the hauler, the final disposal site, and um, it also includes the C and D debris that we hauled to Maysville. Um, to date, we have approximately $195,000 in overtime related to the storm. I don't know how much more overtime we're going to have, but I think that we're going to have some regular time expenditures that we'll be able to claim if our employees do. Like I know we talked about um, facilities maintenance was going to do a couple of the small roof repairs. Their regular time can be charged to FEMA while they're doing those type of repairs. And then we have 230000 other. And I believe that there's still more to be uncovered in the next month or so. You know, when you look at basically uh, you know, five million dollars of, of uh, issue, it does go back and show you the wisdom that the mayor and council have relative to a good fund balance. You all have set the goal for years for I believe it's a what minimum ten percent, and I believe the last time the audit was submitted, we were at about 24, 25 percent of the general fund. We have a fund balance that's equal to that. We would expect that when we submit all this information to FEMA that we'll get the check in about 48 hours. So we'll <laughs> <laughs> Not. <laughs> uh, now, how do you, how does, what determines if something goes to FEMA or if it goes to your insurance? You must file your insurance first. If the insurance does not cover it, then it becomes FEMA eligible. So, so like anything that's a deductible on the insurance or anything that's not covered under the insurance, the debris removal is not an insurable item, yeah, anything like that. But you know, it also brings up the point. Uh, at this point, the league's risk management staff is inundated. They've been on site back in October. We're still waiting for them to uh, tell us what they're gonna pay. But we can't let our buildings continue to have roof damage and so forth. So in addition to the roughly $5 million that we have in front for the large things like the horticultural, we're also fronting now money for just buying shingles and things of that nature. And again, that's why you have to have a strong fund balance. Also, I have mentioned to you in the past, uh, we are currently, we have currently frozen a lot of our capital improvement projects that you had approved for this year. I'll give you an example. Uh, you have in the budget $172,000 to take Old Fire Station 2 on Barn Street and turn it into a recreation center. Well, uh, that roof, amazingly enough, didn't leak. But we're not going to spend that $172,000 there, at least not at this point, because you look at Jack M. Yet that had the roof completely ripped off. We may have to short-term and maybe permanently redirect that $172,000 to fix Jack M. Yet. But those are additional expenses that we have to front, and then at some point we will get insurance and potentially FEMA reimbursement. The other point I'd make is Carolyn Lamp is the lady in finance who uh, Gail has trained. Carolyn has now, this is I believe her third, her second, her second, storm. Her second storm, and she really has the, the staff uh, whipped into shape, let's say. <laughs> they all know the rules about uh, don't buy it unless you can document it and all about the timesheets. Uh, Gail and her staff have really done an outstanding job because without this, your finances are in jeopardy. Anything else? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Let's talk about a few recommendations from the city manager's office. One of the issues that we faced was how do you shelter city employee families if those city employees are in fact on call? We have set up through uh, Chief Inera a study committee of city employees. He has uh, taken the leadership on that to try to determine what we can do to shelter city employee families. Now we're not talking about someone, uh, for example, like one of the secretaries in our office who's not in call, on call during the storm. 
But for example, if you have police officers, firefighters, utility workers, street people, transportation people, and they are required to be here, where do their families go? Many of them obviously stayed at home. Many of them left the community. But one of the, one of the concerns that the employees have mentioned to us is, look, I had to stay through this. I lost communication with my family. So you can appreciate the, the anxiety that that created. We don't know what the solution is. I was talking to Mike earlier today. We expect to have a report to you in the months ahead. It will be expensive. We just don't know what the options are gonna be. Most of our buildings are built to a cat two. Well, that's great. What do you do when Florence is headed to you and everybody's saying it's cat four? The other thing is the city EOC. The building, when, uh, when it was designed at the Center for Public Safety, it has the EOC in it. I'm gonna tell you, that was a good design. But we also know, and many of you visited the, uh, the EOC during the storm and after the storm, we found that the, what I'll call the structure of the meeting room could sometimes create chaos because you had too many people talking at the same time over different conversations. So one of the things we're gonna do is, is work with uh, Jerry and Sean in the fire department, with Mike as the Center for Public Safety Director, and determine how we might be able to restructure the EOC so that it can become, uh, while it's a safe environment, a more coordinated and functional environment. Mm -hmm. Evacuation protocols. One of the things that we want to be talking to the county and the base about is establishing the evacuation protocol. We know that the county issued a mandatory evacuation. We issued a voluntary. We know that the base issued a voluntary. That gives confusion to the public. And therefore, one of the issues and, and discussion points with the county and the base for the future is how do we do a better job of communicating and determining evacuation requirements. We also know that the main lift station there on uh, Marine Boulevard at Cheney Creek it lost power with Duke. And we need to work with them to find out, even though we had backup generators, you know from the reports we gave you that we had a lot of problems with the backup generator. So that's one of the recommendations that we're following through on with Wally and his staff. Purchases, things that you, uh, you know, just common sense things. We actually need more satellite cell phones because we know that while we all have cell phones today, and I heard of at least a, a new member of city council, let me say it differently, our leader in city council, the mayor, uh, informed us today in a meeting, he no longer has a landline. It's been cut. Well, guess what? If we're all dependent upon cell phones and the cell phone towers go down, how do we communicate? So we're looking at purchasing satellite phones. Upgrading rain gear. We provide rain gear to a lot of people. On the other hand, we don't buy 30 hour rain gear. So a lot of the rain gear that we have, you know, after a while, it just simply gets too wet. So little things like that. Generator at City Hall, portable generators, eight more 800 megahertz radios, a drone, a fuel trailer, constant supplies. On the fuel trailer, one of the things that we realized is most of our plans assume that the storm is going to be a typical storm. It comes and it goes. That's fine because we have holding capacity at our generators. But when it hangs around like Florence did, how do you refuel? Other purchases, a fuel pump system. For example, we had a transfer truck come in with a full load. But as you know, in the past, you've authorized, and one of the recommendations that came out of Irene was for us to increase the size of our gas and diesel tanks over at Fleet. Well, we did that. When there's no electricity, how do you get the gas from a truck to a tank that's above ground when they're at equal levels? You know, it was in the old days, Mother Nature took it down the ground, but we no longer have underground tanks. So we learn from every one of these events, and you are going to see many of these things in the FY20 budget. FEMA acquisition program, uh, Ron, why don't you run through where we are on that? 
<clears throat> well, we the, the suspense was in December, December 7th, I believe, uh, and we submitted uh, basically 12 requests, Ryan? 16. 16, 16 four for, buildings. for four buildings. Oh, no, no. And we're waiting for word back. You know, I mean, the state is evaluating them and they'll be prioritized and then they'll determine uh, how much money they'll make available to which requests and that's so. Uh, what, what would FEMA do if they ex if they accept the uh, application or look favorably? What would they do? Would they, do well, they then, buy the properties? Well, then we go, we start the process, yes, they'll go through properties would be appraised and, and <clears throat> right. Good evening, Mayor Council. So we have submitted our letter of interest for the round one, which was a priority round. And we had four buildings uh, where all four units submitted their application. So we've keyed that into the state's electronic system and we're waiting to hear back. And then there'll be a second round, if anybody's interested, that'll be due, I believe it's uh, due to us by the 1st of February and we have to have it keyed by the 8th of February. And that'll be round two if there's monies available. So I'm hopeful that we'll know something you know, between now and the end of the month, and if we're selected, then we will file the official application to go through that process. And that process uh, results in appraisals, and those appraisals are pre-storm appraisals. One of the questions that was asked from a Shoreline resident was, well, if they appraise my property today, it's not gonna be worth much. Well, the, the guidelines say it's a pre-storm appraisal. And if, and if they buy it, then no longer can be built upon? Is that, is that one of the restrictions? Correct. If the building will be torn down as part of the process, and then the property it? will be deeded to the city. Deed problems, what, one or two owns, who owns a property? So we could put some sort of a little park, if, if you know, just in a, thinking out loud, if we needed to do something with it to where we could there's make very, it look nice. There's a few uses, but they are very limited. Right. I would think it'd be passive. Some Correct. sort of passive recreation, just a little. Cannot have any vertical structures right. on them at all. The other thing that you'll notice is when we discuss this uh, process with you, you as a council establish guidelines that we work within. For example, totally voluntary. The city's not going to condemn anybody's property out there and say that they have to sell or whatever. The second thing was you agreed that if it's a townhouse, then all in the building must agree. For the record, we had several uh, several other units in some of the other four unit buildings in Shoreline that submitted applications, but they did not meet this criteria. We had one that I think had three of the four, but it didn't have four of the four. We had, uh, I think, one that just had maybe one in it. But the point we're making is you establish these local standards and we have adhered to those. So again, the 16 units on shoreline, that means that four full buildings. It makes sense to me that uh, that a townhome should be, everyone has to agree. You just got common walls. I mean, you know, there's just too much shared infrastructure that you just can't separate very easily. I, is that, do y'all still agreeing after, after you've worked through this process? Correct. Okay. Are they tenants in common over there? I'm sorry. Are they tenants in common, or is it each individual? Each individual. Yeah. Each individual. Even though they're connected. Yes. Yeah. Such. Correct. Anything else on this part? It's it's just a zero setback situation. Got it. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan has really done a great job, and Ron's done a great job. Uh, the SBA has been in town since right after the storm. They rotate liaisons. I'm very <laughs> pleased to introduce to you. Uh, Pedro or Pete Cento. Uh, Pete and I come from a common background in South Florida. He's really a great guy. He's been in disaster recovery with SBA for a long time, and he will be with us for several months, and he will rotate out too. So Pete, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mayor and City Council members. Thank you for inviting me to your meeting. Um, what I wanted to talk about and to stress is um, that the SBA is here. Of course, we work in partnership with FEMA, and I also worked on the FEMA side for eight years as a public affairs officer. And um, there, even though the deadline passed to register with FEMA, that was December 19th. 
Um, there is still uh, assistance that's available and homeowners and business owners can still apply um, for disaster loans. Now, even though the deadline passed, there's a 60 day grace period. So it's not something that FEMA normally goes out and says to the public because they set up deadlines and extend deadlines based on the need of the governor of whatever state they're in and also local uh, officials, mayors, uh, county managers and so forth. But the reality is that even though the deadline was December 19th, there's 60 days from that date um, for homeowners, renters, and business owners to re first is to register with FEMA, and the second step is they kick it over to the SBA side. Now, I'll bless you. So uh, there's a three-step process for applying for a disaster loan. The first, of course, is that you need to apply for a disaster loan, and the most, the easiest way to do it is just to go online to the website that you see on the screen, which is disasterloan.sba.gov forward slash ELA. Um, you can also contact our customer service number, which is 1 800 295. Oops, where do we have it here? I know it's not here somewhere. Um, anyhow, uh, there's a customer. Is it at the bottom? Yeah, on, the, on this slide, it was there, there, there. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I have a lot of uh, telephone numbers in my head, but 1-800-659-2955. And um, there are representative and loan specialists um, who can help answer questions. The final, uh, the final option, um, and a lot of people prefer to meet with an individual face-to-face, because a lot of times you have questions and, and, uh, and it's a lot easier if you're sitting across the table from someone. And you can do that at our disaster loan outreach centers. Now there's three centers that are still available, that are still open. One of them of course is right here in, um, in the county at the Onslow County Government Center where the county manager's office is. It's on the first floor, I believe it's in room seven. They're open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. And you can actually go there, sit down with a loan specialist, and they can walk you through the loan application. The other thing is, once you apply for a loan, um, then an inspector will come out to take a look at your property. Just like with FEMA. When you register with FEMA, you're assigned uh, a FEMA registration number, then an inspector comes out to take a look at your property and a determination is made whether or not you qualify for any kind of grant money, which is money that you don't have to pay back. Same thing with the SBA. Uh, an inspector will come out to take a look at the damage. They will assess whether or not um, it qualifies. Um, pretty much as long as you have good credit, it doesn't have to be excellent credit, but you have to be able to uh, have the ability to repay a loan. So unfortunately, if someone is unemployed and they had damage to their home, if they don't have a job or can demonstrate an ability to repay a loan, more than likely they will not qualify for a loan. But if you have a job, uh, more than likely you'll be able to uh, qualify for a loan. Uh, for businesses, the loan amounts uh, go up to $2 million. For homeowners, uh, the loan amount that they may qualify for is up to $200,000. That's to rebuild the physical structure, the roof, the walls, that kind of thing. Um, for personal property, there, uh, there are loans that are available up to $40,000, and that may cover a vehicle, your clothes, your furniture, your laptop, TVs, that kind of stuff. So, but the first step in the whole disaster process, if you're a homeowner um, and or a business owner is you must register with FEMA. And even though the deadline passed, there is 60 days. And it's not something that, you know, that, uh, that public affairs people or that we go out and say to the media because we want people 
to register by whatever deadline. And I believe the deadline here in North Carolina was extended at least once or twice at the request of the governor. So, but options are still available. So um, we're here, you know, uh, we're here to help. Um, uh, I have some literature that I can leave um, with you to put out when people come to the city, if they have any questions, that kind of thing. And um, we're just happy to, you know, to be able to work with you, with the county, and all of the different uh, counties that were part of the disaster declaration from the president um, back in September. So, you know, the mayor and council will recall, without mentioning a specific name, that over the weekend we all received an email about a lady who was having housing issues. On uh, Monday morning, I was able to call Pete. Pete immediately, even though uh, she was a renter. Uh, he was able to give me some direction. We were able to put that lady in contact with people who potentially are going to work out a temporary trailer for her as part of their housing assistance. But again, we wanted, we know that two months ago we had FEMA representatives and SBA representatives here. There's still a lot of need in our community. I appreciate Pete being willing to come tonight. And the numbers are on the screen, but if you're in the viewing audience and you just need assistance, Call City Hall, we will get you Pete's numbers and the FEMA folks' numbers and uh, continue to uh, work to see if we can solve your problems. Pete, any last minute comments? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the information. Thank you. You're welcome. Good to see you. Mayor and Council, if you would like, we might take just a couple of minute uh, break and then we'd like to talk with you about. Uh, mobile homes and the UDA requirements because many mobile homes were damaged during the storm. Our regulations uh, limit their ability to be replaced. Would you like to take a short break and then come back and finish the workshop? That sounds good, Joe. Yep. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Okay, we're, we're back in session. Mayor and Council, one of the issues that came out of the storm was the fact that many mobile homes were damaged in the community. Obviously, we know many stick-built structures were also damaged. What we've asked Ryan and, and Jeremy to do is to look at the current UDO and to refresh our memories on what the regulations are relative to the replacement of mobile homes. So what we'd like to do tonight is have the two of them give you an overview of the current regulations. We're not going to be uh, specifically giving you options for the future, but we are going to be asking for, for guidance. So, gentlemen. Right, thank you, Dr. Woodard. Mayor and Council, as Dr. Woodard stated, we are going to discuss mobile home matters as it relates to the Unified Development Ordinance and storm damage. We're also going to tie in a little bit of the temporary residence piece as it relates to the FEMA houses that, were, that was mentioned in the first segment. Um, and as well as some changes that were good changes that occurred with the adoption of the UDO. So as been documented in the three different reports the city council and earlier this evening, significant damage was experienced by all the citizens or even with to the citizens of Jacksonville and all types of housing, whether it be apartments or townhouses, site built, mobile homes, etc. So staff looked at this as an evaluation <laughs> opportunity. And we, we want to talk tonight about four specific areas. Uh, the first one being temporary on-site residents. When the UDO was adopted in 2014, there was actually a provision that was included that allows temporary on-site residences due to um, casualty damage. So we have permitted several of these travel trailers at people's houses to serve as a home while they repair their permanent home. So having that piece in our ordinance allowed Jeremy and myself to issue permits so that people had somewhere to stay at their home site during those repairs. We also had uh, several offices that were damaged that we also had a provision in our ordinance that allowed us to issue temporary offices, I believe, for construction. Ironically enough, was one, and um, John Zonslow was another. So having those things within the ordinance 
where it was clear and specified made it very easy for us to allow that without any questions. It was already set up within the temporary use standards of the code. One piece that we're going to talk about tonight is the fact that we really don't have anything for temporary off-site. We did have a provision where FEMA came to the city for Holiday City, and as you, council may remember, we adopted a planned development district for the Holiday City mobile home. So there was a provision there, not really temporary, that came in and permitted 25 mobile homes for FEMA housing. We've approved on the permitting end 19 of those to date. We received two additional plans this afternoon late, and we're waiting for two more. There's two others that had problems because they didn't meet the standards. So we're, we've started the inspection process. The state of North Carolina created some exemptions as it relates to some of the building codes. For example, if you go into the Holiday City neighborhood, you'll see that there's water and sewer lines are above ground. That's not normal, but in this case, because they're temporary, the state basically said it's okay that they be above ground. Uh, the last the last piece is the Article 7, or non-conforming section of the ordinance. And this is where, in years past, and I'll get into the history here in one moment, where it allowed mobile homes to be swapped one for one. That's no longer in there, so if the mobile homes are not permitted by the zoning uh, use table, then if they're damaged or destroyed beyond 50%, they cannot be replaced. So to give you some mobile home history, uh, between August of 2000 and August of 2010, this is kind of go back to my knowledge of what was being applied here in the city of Jacksonville. The code did not allow units to be swapped one for one. At some point in that decade, there was a policy decision made using Michael Bro, who's a planner, guru, attorney, that you know there was a decision made that we were going to allow mobile homes to be swapped one for one. We codified that when we brought a text amendment to city council on August 4th, 2010. At the same time, we were working on finalizing the Unified Development Ordinance, and we came before the city council on June 12th, 2012, as one of the policy issues, and we once again asked council, does city council want to allow the one-for-one -one swaps for mobile homes that are non-conforming? And at the time, city council said, no, let's not allow the one-for-one -one swap any longer because the activity was viewed as an impediment for revitalization. So that's kind of where we are today. The code was adopted in July of 2014, and we cannot allow the one-for-one -one swaps. So I'm gonna talk to you about two different types of mobile homes. The first, the first mobile home is where you have one mobile home on one lot, so not a mobile home uh, park. The only districts that a mobile home dwelling on a single lot is allowed is in two zoning districts in the city of Jacksonville, so the RSF 40 and the RSF 20 districts. They have to meet the standards found in B, 1, D, and the additional standards. And those standards are, they have to be oriented parallel to the street, the lights, the tongue, the hitch have to be removed, the roof and siding finishes should be that that you would typically see with stick built construction. They also have to be placed on a permanent foundation, such as a brick, stone, or masonry foundation. These are the zoning districts throughout the city, and it's primarily the ETJ, if not all the ETJ, with the exception of uh, Williams Farm, and, and I doubt the covenants would allow that to begin with. But these are the locations within the city of Jacksonville, or uh, the zoning or planning <coughs> jurisdiction, that you can have one mobile home per lot. So you can see the core area, the core center of the city, they are not allowed within <coughs> the city limits. The state law says that we have to allow mobile homes. We cannot prohibit them throughout our jurisdiction. We have to allow them in some zoning districts within the city. The second part is the mobile home parks. These are the more commercial type scenarios or a subdivision. Maynard Manor is a mobile home subdivision, so that would kind of fall underneath the mobile home subdivision standard. That use is allowed in three districts. They're all special use permits, and they too have additional standards. <coughs> now these standards are gonna be quite a bit more, and I'm gonna just key on some of the main ones. They have to be 10 acres minimum size. They have to be the 1976 standards or, or newer. 
They cannot be sold spaces. They have to be maintained by the park. You have uh, minimum widths and lot size. Even though the lots are not deeded lots, you, you basically say, okay, well, a mobile home lot, you need to have some common, not common area, but personal area for each resident to have. So 35 foot minimum width, 4,000 square foot area. We also require the 30 foot type A buffer on all perimeters. We deal with centralized garbage and waste collection points. Needs to be maintained and orderly. We also have setbacks from mobile home spaces as well as mobile home, uh, yeah, from mobile home spaces. So 10 feet from any mobile home space boundary, 20 feet from internal streets, 25 feet from any public right away. We have some access standards. Uh, one of the big ones here is that you have to have a 30 foot right away for the internal park drives. You have to have a 22 foot wide um, paved, one and a half inch paved asphalt travel way. So we know that some of the mobile home parks that we have in Jacksonville, they don't have a 22 foot wide travel way. And that may be one impediment that would keep them from coming before city council and trying to get the special use permit approved because they couldn't just hire a surveyor, go through the process and be in business. They would actually have to make some improvements because they have, for lack of a better term, a substandard mobile home park in terms of our standards. We also have um, lighting requirements as if they were city streets, as well as minimum cul-de-sac dimensions so that emergency vehicles can go in there and turn around if necessary. Gotta be served with potable water, be built to the state building code, and the, owner, the park owner is responsible for the refuse. So the orange and the green areas on your screen are the different zoning areas that allow both or allow the mobile home parks or subdivisions. So you can see the same areas as the mobile home parks, one per lot, but now within the city, the center core, there's quite a bit more land area where mobile home parks could go through the process of getting that special use permit approved if they meet the design standards. One other thing that I mentioned was our temporary use standards. So going away from mobile homes again, uh, we mentioned offices, uh, temporary quarters for non-residential uses, temporary residences for on-site. And I highlight that on-site piece because the we may want to, with our options, talk about would we want to create a provision for off-site. Let's say that we didn't have a holiday city where, you know, FEMA could come in and apply for 25 units. Do we need to have something that allows an off-site um, home be set up for our residences. So the question boils down to, you know, do we leave the UDO as it's written and just stay the course? Or do you feel that we need to look to make some amendments? And if we look to make amendments, kind of break them up into two different areas. One, the temporary offsite housing, and we would want to preface that it should be managed by FEMA. The reason why we think that's important is because they're strict standards. They have a 24-7 call-in line, so if somebody has a problem, they can pick up a phone, call maintenance. They have to respond within five hours, from what I understand. So it's really a regimented process and, and managed by FEMA. So do we want to create something to where, let's say that FEMA leases 15 acres and they set up 100 FEMA houses there. Right now, we don't have a zoning provision that would allow that. So do we want to create it so that we're ready for the next event? <clears throat> Maybe even for this event, if, if council were to direct us to move forward with that and we bring something forward, that if, if FEMA needed something beyond what they have with Holiday City, this would kind of create an opportunity. Right. what is the length of time? Or is there an established length of time that this temporary units can be there? So the, the temporary use table specifies one to three years. So we've issued several travel trailers, for lack of a better, better term, and they've got one to three years that they can stay in that home while they repair their homes. But is the issuance of the permit for the temporary unit, your, your travel trailer in your driveway, also uh, contingent upon you getting a building permit to repair your house? Uh, I believe that's the case. It's, there's temporary use standards. I believe that's kind of covered within that. So, well, do, we, do we have a large enough footprint that FEMA could use anywhere within the city? I mean, 
there's obviously a place for temporary offsite managed by FEMA for a disaster <clears throat> issue, but do we even have land mass that would even accommodate that? Well, I believe there's some even land. If we had it, would it would there be a place that they could do that? I mean, I believe that there's some places for along Western Boulevard, for example, that may they could go in there and, and I know Dr. Woodruff had with his previous experience. I mean, they designed and set up these temporary housing communities. Right, but they're not purchasing land. They would have to they could lease it. Yeah, the way the process normally works, and, and let me put it this way, the way it worked in Florida on several hurricanes that we operated from a private standpoint, uh, FEMA comes in and leases the property from the private property owner. FEMA then hires someone to completely set up the park, bring in necessary field dirt, create the roads, move in the units. After a certain period of time, the FEMA program requires all of that to be completely removed and the property has to be returned to the pre-development state, even after haul off the filter. FEMA has found that to be very expensive and not realistic. That's why, if you notice in this storm, one of the first offers from FEMA for housing is travel trailers in your front yard. I can tell you that is a great thing because it allows the family to stay in their own neighborhood, their children to go to their own school, all of the things that you're used to, and FEMA doesn't have to build the infrastructure. The road's already there, you connect to the water and sewer, all those type things. There, there may be a case, I think it may be rare, but there may be a case where we would need this. So being proactive, we would recommend that we design this so that it could be utilized. Will it be? I hope not. I mean, I would, I would agree with that, but why can we do it as a special use? You could certainly you could do it come as forward and, and have it predefined, but it would be a special use that we would have to look at and approve. And there has to be some you, limitations right. on it. You could. Where it's located or where you put it. You, you could. There's a couple of things that I would just kind of throw out there. There's number one, that's going to lengthen the amount of time it takes to go through that process. And it also could be... Just like the legislature told the cities that we could not charge permit fees, and I know the city council made that decision on your own before the state did, but they told us that we could not require permit fees. The state could tell us that we cannot enforce zoning regulations for temporary housing. So, I mean, if something like that were to occur at the state level, then our hands would be tied. Well, the only use for the special use permit, as I see it, is to ensure that it's in the proper location and it's you know, properly designed more so than anything. Obviously, if you have a major disaster, you want to take care of people that are out of their homes. But at the same token, I think we want some oversight as to location and the qualifications of what that may look like and where it may be located. Uh, what they do. Is that what they do in Florida? Or? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and what we could do, you know, these are ideas that we're asking, do you want us to spend time exploring? Well, I think you we know, should have it in our tool bag. What, what, is, what is going on with some of the other communities that have experienced the same thing in our region? Um, have, have you reached out? So just based on the discussions with the contractor that's setting up the 25 homes at Holiday City, there was one that was being set up in Onslow County. We've dealt with several private residences where their insurance company, not FEMA, gave them um, temporary quarters and set it up there at their houses. Uh, Pender County's dealt with some of them, but I don't know the numbers. I just know that Jackson has been 25 and it sounds like Onslow County only had one one FEMA trailer that's been set up. But I think Eric said about 600 was being set up throughout the eastern part of the state. Mayor, one of the things, uh, we actually haven't done the research that you're asking because unless y'all are interested in us creating this type thing, I don't want to direct the staff to have that time. But let's, let's take, for example, when Hurricane Charlie came through the Naples, Fort Myers, Punta Gorda, Sarasota area, uh, it literally wiped out uh, about 6,000 residences. I'm not talking about damaged, I'm talking about psh, gone. Uh, by setting up these temporary mobile home parks, FEMA was able to get them in in a very short period of time, like 90 days. If we had had a Category 3 or a Category 4, and we had had the level of damage that we think we would have had, then this is an option that I definitely think we would have to be looking at. So I would certainly recommend to you that we look at 
what other communities are doing, how we can add this as, as to use your words, Mr. Lazera, a tool in the box. We will bring back to you the, the standards for that. Now, so are you pretty comfortable? Are you comfortable authorizing us to, to look at and putting staff time on that amount of work where what you're talking about doing is setting up a temporary mobile home park under strict guidelines that would include your approval process. Very strict. Yeah. Yeah. Are those and, time sensitive as well? I'm sorry? Are those, do they have time limitations on yes. this FEMA? Yes. So not indefinite. It's, it's a, what we're hearing with Holiday City is 18 months, but they could go longer than that. <clears throat> So what they try to do is if you're less than, I think they said if you're around a year's time or less, they try to try to go the travel trailer route. And if you're longer than that, they're they're trying to use them. The and I heard you say contractor. Is this FEMA or FEMA subcontracts with a private FEMA subcontracts? With a private entity. Correct. To do these sort of parts. Well, right now, you know, they they're contracted with an entity to provide the trailer, set it, and and basically manage it on somebody's approved site. Right. You know, and and now this I don't know if they do the same contractor to set up in a site that FEMA <coughs> has created. Yeah. In in the parks that we helped develop in Florida for hurt and recovery, it was all through FEMA. Yeah. Now what? What Ron and, and Ryan are talking about is where we already have a mobile home park, such as Holiday City. And in that case, you're not developing the land and the infrastructure, you're simply bringing in units. What FEMA is doing in Jacksonville today is bringing in units through a subcontractor. On the but other hand- It would have to be strictly a FEMA program. Well, that's what we're saying, so we, we, we agree with that. that because it's managed by FEMA, their strict standards, Versus, you know, Ryan wants to set up 10 acres and bring in a bunch of travel trailers and rent them out and not maintain them like I need to maintain them. I guess them. the bottom line is, is we want to be able to accommodate people that have been victims of these this, this disastrous, terrible exactly. thing. A lot of people are put in a really bad you know, position with their, you know, with their living, uh, you know, having a place to live. But in the same respect, we don't want this to become a permanent condition. And we're we're reading exactly what you're saying, and that's what we're what we would be designing. So, All right. Are good with it? You're, you're asking for guidance on yeah. that. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes. Yeah. We're not asking you to approve anything other than staff time going to research this <coughs> and bring you back specifications. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Yes. Sounds like you've got unanimity here. Okay, and on the second piece, same type of discussion on mobile homes. You know, to city council, would you like to see staff, you know, go back to a one-for-one -one swap? You know, expand the zoning districts uh, beyond the green area that I showed a second ago? Uh, tweak the mobile home park standards that may allow some of these current parks easier access to conformity? Or it's acceptable as it is? change anything like that then what that does is extend how long there's going to be a mobile home right. on those sites because you're allowing a new one to be brought in and that's going to last who knows how long uh, if you expand zoning districts you're putting them in places where you've already right Ryan are you seeing a lot of requests uh, Jeremy I mean that's we've had a handful over the we, years I mean we've had a handful not directly resented result from Florence. Um, That's what I'm interested yeah. in. As a direct I think from Florence from we've school. had maybe two, you know, which has been <coughs> surprising yeah. that it's been that little. Um, typically when you have someone who's needs to replace a mobile home, the moment you say that a modular building construction is an option, they jump on that because it is an upgrade, but you can get a similar dimensions and not too far off in price compared to a new mobile home. Right. And it's the, the tougher situations are when someone wants to replace a mobile home on a lot that is already not conforming because it's one mobile home on a lot with five other homes, be it stick build or multiple mobile homes. Just, uh, yeah, I'll review it, but make sure you uh, work closely with Mr. Carter there to make sure we don't damage our ordinance, well, I guess, uh, 
are existing. Well, you know, the, the, the approach that I would recommend, to be quite frank with you, is a good example, ride through Collins Heights. You all know where that is off of Wilma. That is a neighborhood that, for all practical purposes, is, is full of mobile homes. They've been well kept. Many of them are owner occupied. Some of them are, are, are leased. Those mobile homes, if they're damaged, uh, their options are, as Jeremy said, you can bring in a modular unit or you can build a single family home. Not necessarily a bad option. Uh, so you sometimes through. you can't do that at all if there's more than one home well, already there. So there's, they don't always have that option, but sometimes, yes, that is the, a potential yeah. option. Uh, and the other thing <laughs> is, uh, I remember when uh, the discussion on the UDO, Mr. Willingham was a uh, council member at that time, and he was one who spoke uh, very strongly about eliminating mobile homes. And I can understand his, his thinking there. If you now ride through Georgetown, which is generally adjacent to Collin Heights, you will find that over the years, almost all the mobile homes are gone. I believe uh, today you uh, rode through, uh, Mr. Jackson, you rode through Georgetown. I believe you told me there were, what, three, three mobile homes three. left? There was a, about yeah. three in Georgetown. Well, I think, I think, I think it's, it's kind of a sad, yeah. It's kind of a vanishing thing anyway. Right. I mean, you know, I, my understanding is the, mili the military doesn't pay VA community more for mobile homes. Is that? I don't know. But the point I'm the point I'm making is that um, I think you're looking at the individuals who have called and said, "My mobile home was damaged. I want to bring a new mobile home in." Uh, the staff is simply saying the UDO does not allow that. You can have a stick built home, or you can have a modular unit built in. Personally, I think that that is a reasonable standard because what it helps us do is redevelop. But that's what I'm going to call a political, you know, it's easy for me as a bureaucrat to say that's a reasonable standard because one of my responsibilities that you've given us is to redevelop the community. What we're to ask you to do, though, is spend time over the next several weeks riding through some of the lower income areas. There are areas uh, off of 17 in the area behind uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, all in that area that has some. Uh, Ryan can give you better locations. And that way you can get a feel because, interestingly enough, there are a number of owner-occupied, let me say it different, there are a number of individual mobile homes on individual lots. Some of them are owner-occupied, some of them are leased. It's a policy decision from your standpoint as elected officials. How do you feel about those units? You know, it's easy when you deal with Holiday City because what we've set up through your approval in UDO are good standards that say, yeah, we're going to have mobile home parks. But they're going to be mobile home parks. They're going to be well designed. They're going to be the way it should be. And then there is the scattering of individual mobile homes. And when they get damaged by fire or by a hurricane, our position as a staff is, sorry, you do have two options. And that's where, personally, I think that that's where we need to stay. But that's a policy decision that you as a council need to determine is that where you are as this council in 2019. City staff is working with the county right now to be able to provide the city council with a map that shows the locations of mobile homes in the city in case that's of assistance to you. We can pull some building permit information, but that only goes back to 1998. So that may not give you a full picture of where they are. So we are in the process of trying to gather that information, get it put together on a map, and we will provide that if we can make that happen. I appreciate that. Also, I have a concern. Uh, if, if we say that uh, we're going to make exceptions for nonconformity replacements for mobile homes, I think we damage, potentially damage our um, nonconformity uh, statutes. If, if we're saying that if, if we're going to allow mobile homes, ones, well, why then... You know, why can't I, I, my my business, my property, my residence is non-conformity and it's been damaged. I want to, I just want to replace it. I don't want to have to meet 
standards to be conforming. That would concern me. I think what they're talking about, and I've not been engaged in these conversations, but is in those situations where you have a mobile home on a single lot, then you're making it conforming. That is, that mobile home is no longer non-conforming, and if that gets destroyed or whatever, they can put another mobile home on there. So you do away with the non-conforming argument. Now, if you have a single lot with three mobile homes on it, then I don't think y'all are advocating at all that if one of those is destroyed, that you can put it back, because that truly is non-conforming. Again, one residence on one lot. Well, actually, let me, let me yeah. answer that both ways. Um, John has a favorite word in the law. And what is that favorite word? We'll use it several times, consistency. Consistency. And that's the point that Mr. Warden is pointing out. How do you say that we're going to allow this nonconformity to continue and be replaced, but this nonconformity we're not? Most of the nonconforming mobile homes are nonconforming because of the zoning district they're in. Right. So, for example, let's say you got a block where eight, let's say it has 20 lots in it. 18 of those lots have single family homes on them that are stick built, and two have mobile homes. Well, you can't go in and rezone just those two lots. So, are you then going to say that mobile homes are a permitted use? If you are, then suddenly you could wind up with 20 mobile homes instead of 18 stick built. That's why I say again, from the manager's position, we want to explain to you the, the issue that certain citizens have raised. Mm -hmm. But as a planner, as well as your manager, I'm suggesting to you ride the community. I'm not, I, I, I will say to you, I don't recommend that you go there. Go there to see it, but don't go there to change your ordinance. Now, if there are some <laughs> mobile home clusters, such as some of the areas over in the area off of 17, maybe what we should do is look at a new zoning district just for that small cluster. But uh, again, uh, I would, I, I think that we have I think that we are properly regulating mobile homes at this time, but that's a policy decision y'all have to make. To, to answer Councilman Bittner's question, we're work, we hope to have the information tomorrow that we can then put in a GIS to get you that map. Uh, the county was going through some sort of a transition. I don't know if it was a software change, but uh, the person, Tiffany, I believe that I'm dealing with, because uh, I'm, I'm working with GIS on getting that information, I think she said it, she would try to get it today, which she didn't get, but if not, it would be tomorrow. But um, so, that, so we can produce that. Obviously, we're going to want to look at it to make sure, yes, yeah. that's, that it lines up. It's all based on codes, tax codes, and um, they've got different codes based on single wides and double wides, and we want to plop that down on a map and you can check it for accuracy. And then. We have any situations where we're under press, pressure? I don't think no, we have no right we haven't, We've got... Um, a few citizens who asked the question, you know, we told them that we may be discussing, but nothing that they were like, you know, I'm homeless tomorrow. Um, but there are some people who are kind of buying their time looking to see which way this goes. So it can help them make a better decision. We, we did have one mobile home park off along Kennedy Road mm -hmm. in the ETJ yeah. that had quite a few damaged. They're in the right zoning district. They could go through the special use permit process if they want to comply with the, the district standards. Is that now, ETJ? That is ETJ. Now, one of the problems that that particular <coughs> location has is it's just shy of 10 acres. So it doesn't meet the 10 acre size. And that was one of the reasons why we mentioned, do we want to change the district standards for the mobile home parks? Is 10 acres too big? Is that just right? Is it too small? They could acquire some. Uh, they could acquire an acre of land, possibly, and then they would have sufficient size. Let us work on this for you. Right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Good job. Uh, good Thank job. you, Jeremy, Ryan. Very good job. Uh, YMCA update. I've asked Ron if he will run us through this quickly, please. Just a quick thing. Just a little background on the discussion before the discussion on the fire suppression, but the uh, you know the the. The uh, YMCA uh, organization is moving forward, and uh, they're uh, they're starting the the uh, preparation of the final uh, engineering plans. 
Um, and we're, of course, in the process. We've got our plans uh, being finalized, and we'll bid uh, the roof replacement uh, here later this month and, and hope to have it awarded uh, next month and then get it get it completed as quickly as possible. One of the reasons we got into this discussion is because if they put in firewalls, go to the they, they have to go all the way up to the ceiling and they, they were up to the roof and it impacts on the roof installation. And, and, and that complicates the installation of the roof and it also, you got a new roof and now, you know, you got a, a possible patch in a new roof and it potentially adds to the cost of that roof to our, on our side. So it's kind of like, you know, are we better off? And the, and the YMCA are the ones that introduced the discussion on the sprinkler because they had some debates in trying to control their own costs on as to whether or not it would be cheaper to install a sprinkler, you know, then try and get that construction, the firewall up through the roof. Go to the next one. And, uh, <clears throat> And, then, and like I said, once you do that firewall, obviously the room is the way it is, and and then you just have to go through that again if you reconfigure the building. But when you're also penetrating the roof, you are introducing another potential leak leak possibility too. So absolutely. Yeah. So so again, since they were interested in pursuing the the sprinkler, we looked at what it would take for us to to connect. And uh, you know the connection goes in the alley be would go in the alley behind the building, so it wouldn't be tearing up a bunch of stuff. It's a connection that, as as city manager said, uh, our city crews could certainly lay the pipe from the building out to the right of way, uh, and what we would then possibly do is is hire a contractor just to do the tap and the connection. So that's the cost we're talking about. Go down the next one. So, uh, you know, right now the, the YMCA is, is ready to install the sprinkler system with the understanding that the city would connect the building with the fire supply line. Nine square feet? 9,000? It's about just under 10,000 square feet. So it's about, about the same, you know, the, the internal is roughly the same cost as the external. That's the problem with a small building is the external becomes a bigger chunk of the pie. Yeah, they're, they're cost the oven, that's right. It's, it's too, this estimate for our our part of it is just a tad over what they're estimating they'll get the sprinkler. But it, it, as being building or landlords, I mean we we would benefit from the sprinkler system for potential yeah, future use yeah. yeah. in down the terms road. of yeah. right. you know in, in fairness, uh, I know that Mr. Sewell <clears throat> when uh, when he was here, he said he was not going to come back to the city council and ask for any more money. He is not asking for more money. I am. When when I found that the uh, when I found that the uh, roof was the issue, we had a meeting. I think last Wednesday or one day or last week. The YMCA was was up front. They said, "Look, we we can't justify the expense of a sprinkler system, so we are going to go with a firewall." Well. If you pardon the, the expression, I put on my hat as the building owner of the representative of the owners. You own the building, I'm your representative. I looked at it from a building owner standpoint and said, we don't want a firewall because it impacts long-term flexibility. Once the YMCA moves out, we're stuck with a firewall. If it's in the right place, we got lucky. If it's in the wrong place, we got unlucky. Secondly, penetrations create roof leaks. Third, if somebody else is willing to fund half the sprinkler system, why wouldn't we want that as an investment in our building? So I want to make sure that the public and you understand the why is not asking for this. As the building owner's representative, I'm recommending this to you. The $40,000 would have to come from your four cent fund. I would also say to you, that's the price if we did it with a contractor. We believe that on that back alley, the paved area between it and the Piers building, that our city crews can actually go in there because the contractor will that YMCA will hire, they will put the sprinkler system inside the building. 
They will then have the vault and the tap through the wall. On that back corner, so if you're on chaining, I know there are two chainings, but let's be on the front chaining, not the side chaining. On the front chaining, this would come out of the building at the far back right-hand corner. The city then has, there is a paved strip, it's not an alley, but a paved strip back there. We would then install the pipe from there all the way out to the side chaining, and we would hire a contractor to hot tap the line. Maximum cost, $40,000. I think realistically with us doing it, it's probably more like $25,000 because you're still going to have to have a contractor do the hot tap where this line goes into the hot. The reason why they call it a hot tap is because the line that you're going to be tapping is still pressurized. It's not hot water, by the way. It's just a term. But that's our thinking from a management standpoint, is we believe it's a better investment. It gives you <coughs> long-term flexibility for the building. You need a vote? Move approval. Second. <laughs> All in favor? <coughs> that was unanimous, correct? In the interest of time, let's skip the uh, one city moments, other than to say that uh, every time you go around this community and see how everybody is working together to recover, it truly is one city, and we are indeed fortunate. Uh, Mr. Carter has several items that he would like to discuss in closed session. Mr. Carter, I'll turn it over to you for direction. We'd ask. Sir, uh, go ahead and uh, recess the regular meeting and fill up the closed session. We'll stand up for just a moment. Let everybody. <coughs>